Hello, and welcome to a game I've been procrastinating on playing for like two weeks. <clears throat> I got this as one of my regular rentals, and I've just been putting it off for various reasons. Um, had a headache last night. Last week I was completely consumed by modding fucking Duke Nukem 3D. Um, and... I have to do it this weekend, because at least this weekend I can say that I watched Underworld 1 and 3, and so there's like no excuse for me not to play a modern vampire <laughs> game, uh, as long as I've got it, so. Um, if you're interested in my opinion on, opinions on those movies, I think uh, Underworld 3 is probably the best of the series that I've seen. Uh, Underworld 1 is, eh, okay. Um, it, it gets a little bit too, um, shall I say, interested in spinning its own lore, rather than just kind of dwelling on the themes of what it is. Um, I really don't care about the, the whole angle of, uh, hybridizing vampires and werewolves and stuff. Not really interested in that, the... Uh, random weird technology they inject into it too is kind of goofy and contrived also the overnight romance which is what i like to call it is just complete fucking at shit it's awful really don't enjoy that but uh you know really don't have much of those issues in underworld 3 however underworld 3 is not set in modern day it is uh set in the dark ages so I don't know, it's kind of more of a interesting fantasy film in that case. And it's really just Romeo and Juliet, except with vampires and werewolves in it. That's basically the movie. Anywho, uh, Vampire the Masquerade, I know what that is. It's a tabletop RPG series. Um, one of the most well-known tabletop RPG series, what they call the World of Darkness, is the, uh, the narrative of it. Um, I know very little about it. Very, very, very little about it. I don't think there are werewolves in these games, but there is the whole concept of like a, a shadow coven of vampires that live in the background of society and all that, and they have their own internal politics that kind of governs the game and the story and all that. That's all I know about it. Um, and as far as this game is concerned, I knew nothing about this when I rented it. I, I was like... Uh, Vampire the Masquerade? Sure, let's let's get a PS4 game about that. Now, I was hoping that it was going to be, like, maybe a CRPG or something, because, Jesus fucking Christ, I've been starved, starved of CRPGs that even run, even run, with even a modicum of tolerable performance, but no. It seems like this is just a visual novel, which I'm not thrilled about. Um, but, you know... I can only hope that it's not going to be as insufferably dull as uh, Higurashi was for like an hour and a half of what amount of time I decided to give that game. So this is the first disc of uh, the New York Bundle, I believe is what it's called. We'll just give this a try and I don't know, maybe there'll be some interesting decision making in here. I really don't know. Settings. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Dialogue options in the middle. Middle of what? Dynamic backgrounds. Is that what I'm looking at? Yeah, pretty straightforward. Not very, not very game controls, is there? All right, let's start. Welcome to my castle. Don't expect everyday logic to work here. It went out of the window sometime after midnight. Maybe earlier. My kingdom is not of this world. It lies far outside of concrete, tangible reality. I've tried to identify the way people reach it, and I'm convinced it has something to do with the moon. Some say the moon's aura can turn them insane. 
heard the phrases Moonstruck and Lunatic. The way I see it, Moonlight gives them some subliminal permission to reveal their true selves. So, whenever they let the ra Silver Radiance guide them to the gate to this place, they feel different. Once they pass the doorstep, doorstep they're ready to act out. The dance of horrors and marvels begins. It's 3.31 a.m. Welcome to Big Beat Burger. If you're here at this hour, you're not exactly readying to be a productive member of society come tomorrow morning. More likely, you're praying that the sunrise never comes. Insatiable children of the night gather round, hoping to bask in the afterglow of tonight's victories, unwind after a frustrating series of failures, or simply fight to keep themselves together. Meanwhile, I'm just sitting here, greedily reveling in every interaction they have. They have no idea they are only here for my amusement. To them, I'm just a random girl sitting in the But this is my domain. I've been coming here almost every night for years. I know where to sit, where to look and where to eavesdrop for maximum amusement. I'm basically a voyeur, and unashamed to admit it. it. Gave me insight about the human condition I'd never otherwise have gathered, and more importantly, a necessary skill set to make ends meet as a journalist. As I write on my crappy laptop, patiently waiting for the legion of negative voices in my head to get too tired to offer use feedback, I keep my senses peeled to pick up stories around me. Of course, a lot of regular events, such as food fights, are nothing to write home about, aside from my unfortunate tendency to become collateral damage in someone else's battles. Up to this day, I've had to wash my clothes because of Coke, Diet Coke, hot coffee, apple pie, some sort of uh, improvised honey mustard bomb. Every stain tells a different story. Sometimes this hobby is exhausting, sometimes it's disturbing. Sometimes it's dangerous, although not as risky as back when I wasn't carrying pepper spray. Still, the sights I've taken in over the years here have made it absolutely worth it. I've got so many stories, I don't know where to begin. Okay, so if I'm just, like, not assuming that this person is a vampire right away, then this is genuinely a journalist who shows up to a fast food place late at night in order to get stories like you must report on the most fucking dull shit possible theatrical breakups impromptu morning parties unexpected friendships forged in the fires of senseless battle yeah all all kind of terrible sources a lady in a gorgeous givenchy dress Ordering a box of takeout chicken nuggets, paying in cash with her hands completely covered in blood. She was asked if she wants a napkin. She said no. Two thirsty macho dudes shamelessly going for it in the corner, hushing, moaning, filling the lobby while everyone around valiantly fights to act as usual and maintain an normalcy. Two dudes butt fucking in the corner? What is this place? A straight up kung fu fight between a diminutive cashier some drugged bodybuilder going through a psychotic episode trying to break all the windows. The big guy left the joint fully convinced he'd KO'd himself while the service worker was just standing next to him. Seems proud of his victory, too. A middle-aged tad getting a heart attack after screaming her lungs out not to let Muslims near her food just because she saw a white girl wearing a hairnet behind the counter. A masked couple robbing the restaurants of 30 ha- What am I reading? A masked couple robbing the restaurants of 30 hamburgers, forcing the employees to cook at gunpoint. Police later said they were art students reenacting some hipster book they read. This is life. This is humanity at its worst and best. Probably worst. This is the noise that serves as the foundation for my creativity. This is the soma that keeps me going. This is... <sighs> As pathetic as it may sound these days, this is the only place where I feel alive. Sometimes I feel, think of myself as a leech feeding on these people's stories, emotions, personalities, just because I'm not satisfied with mine. At times I think of my psyche as some kind of shitty postmodern construct that is fundamentally incapable of honesty, but only yearns for something felt and truthful. Does this even make any sense? I look at the screen of my laptop, 3.47 a.m., 
I'm already getting some vibes that this game might be just a little bit, just a little bit politicized. At this point, I'm almost somnabulic. Somnabulic, I've never seen that word before. But something in interesting, I, I assume it's something to do with sleep, but nothing interesting has happened yet. Feels like all the customers are watching each other tonight, hoping for the others to provide a fun diversion. This is my turf, you parasitic douchebags. Next time, go find your own. I think it's time to find, call it a night. The coffee I'll always order so that they don't kick me out is undrinkable. Ugh. I reread the rough draft I've been working on for the last six hours. God damn, this is pure trash. I hold the backspace button until the Google Documents page. Nothing but a calm white slate let out a sound of deep relief. Did we need a... a did we need to reference Google specifically in modern day set vampire game? There is no pleasure more intoxicating for a frustrated writer than ragging on someone even worse than them. Worse than them. And what target is easier than the dumb bitch you used to be ten minutes ago? I checked the time again. Go. I have an important meeting tomorrow at ten a.m. and I have a hunch it's not going to end well. And it's not because I'm an irresponsible dumbass who's going to need a few cups of coffee to simply function as on a basic level, like, despite, like, four hours of sleep. It's because I always have a hunch things are not going to go the way they're supposed to. Click, clack, click, clack, clack. Uh, clatter. Okay, so that entire setup seemed entirely pointless. A uh, loud clatter of keyboards assaults me from all sides, making the splitting headache unbearable. Used to be, I dreamed of nothing else but being part of the New York Lodestar editorial team. The first magazine I started reading regularly. The first magazine I ever bought for myself. Now simply hearing the word Lodestar is enough to root my mood. Never mind seeing all these old farts phoning in more reactionary opinion columns and Wikipedia-level analysis. Back, click, click, back. They used to destroy and rebuild my entire worldview every month. They shaped my thinking about politics, art, journalism. They even pointed me toward my favorite cigarette brand, for God's sake. Then some talented people started leaving for greener pastures. Some got too wrapped up in their own neurosis. Some became complacent. Some even lowered their standards enough to hire me. All of them committed the sin of allowing themselves to grow older. Fresh blood was deemed unnecessary. Even though young freelancers kept being blood dried. These days, whenever someone from outside Lodestar talks about Lodestar, it's because of a few idealistic contributors willing to accept meager pay while putting in serious work. Dumbasses. Other than that, the magazine specializes in publishing pale echoes of provocative ideas I heard somewhere else a few years prior. Wrapped in, a, wrapped in an aesthetic that hasn't been cutting edge for decades. No wonder the readership is in free fall. Even though the ship is sinking, the old guard won't let it go down without a fight. As in, if anyone from the outside attempts to board the vessel in hopes of fixing its force or its holes, they'll be swiftly taken care of. I should know. Been there, done that. As it stands, the only full-time staff member who doesn't make me regularly attempt to cringe my face off with his writing is Lodestar's editor-in-chief, Ryan Igg. The man sitting in front of me right now. Of course, he only has time for editorials these days. A drop in the sea of needs. Managerial duties hit him hard. I don't know why we suddenly have a dramatic backing track. He only has time for editorials. Oh, that seems like a waste. It's the second time he let out a theatrical cough like this. He said his piece, now it's up for me to react, and I'm coming up blank. Uh, what do you want me to say, Brian? I'm pissed off. I can tell you've already made up your mind, but you still want me to go through the motions. To make me feel listened to. Whatever, let's do this. Brian, the guy, is guilty of major fraud. The man is a sexual harasser, Brian. You're protecting a complete piece of shit here. Well, obviously, I don't know the context of this. Brian, the guy is guilty of major fraud. 
right? My article isn't even something like lashing out at the rich and hoping they don't hit back. I think Double Spiral's investors would appreciate being told they're being scammed. That's if, and that's a big if, they're not a conscious part of this game. Oh, come on. And even if they weren't, I doubt they'd be generous enough to protect us from the fallout. You're avoiding the core of the issue. No, I believe I've pinpointed it in a precise way. If it were up to me, I'd greenlight the article here and now, and we wouldn't be having this conversation. But you're killing the article just because some rich shithead told you he doesn't like it. They're real. This is not about some millionaire jerk calling me to make me an offer I can't refuse. What is this about then? Because it looks awfully like. It's about my bosses telling me this outlet can't afford the legal action we have already been threatened with. So, millionaire interference. Oh, for crying out loud, Julia, don't make me treat you like a child. You know how this works. Well, don't fucking blow smoke up my ass if you're gonna bullshit about why we're killing an article. I published your story. It's Steel vs. Gawker all over again. A lawsuit here, a lawsuit there, until we're blood dry. I have a mortgage. I have three mouths waiting to be fed at home. I have an amazing team that doesn't deserve to be torn apart over some. Don't you think it's telling you mentioned your mortgage first? Islands. Just asking questions. I know better than to get into these empty semantic arguments with you, Miss Sawinty. You're good at them. The problem is you're still not good enough. Meaning? You're too in love with weaving a good story and establishing a seductive narrative to get- That is such, that is such fucking exposition talk. What a fat load of shit. Yeah, someone would fucking speak this way at a fucking goddamn newspaper. Shut the hell up. Got enough boring suits with no- uh, principles on board these days. I always give you facts because that's all they can do. I'm using facts as a way to approach some kind of truth. As opposed to what? You're, you guys are supposed to be presenting news! Not editorial schlock! Except facts can blindside you. And Double Spiral has enough facts to water down your story to the point where it makes no sense to publish it. The hell does that mean? Their HR and PR are working overtime to deliver a convincing counter-narrative and doing a great job. Won't mitigate the damage completely, but will put everything, every little thing into question. Jesse Montgomery is a racist, a fraud, a sexual predator, and downright satanic fuckhead. Julia. Let me say it again. Jesse Montgomery is a racist, a fraud, and a sexual predator, and a downright satanic fuckhead. Do you personally believe it or not? This is not... You listen to the tapes, you read the transcripts, you've read the documents, you've got the files, I'm asking for your personal opinion, do you believe it or not? Of course I do, but that's beside the point. It, it's not. Look, how about I say it out loud and save us both some time? We're not having this big conversation because there's an actual conversation to be had. You set this up meeting knowing very damn well there is only one way it's going to end. You've got a mortgage and three mouths to feed. You prioritize the well-being of your direct surroundings over some nebulous concept of greater good. I get it. I really do. Yet for some reason, it seems like you're only prolonging this conversation and rationalizing your decision so that I forgive you, officially exonerate you. I'm not the bad guy here, Julia. So what are you? In your own words man who does what is necessary to protect his own. So, I don't count as your own anymore? Okay, I, I, I just gotta... I mean, I'm only going off what little this game has given me. Game, question mark. Big game. Like, didn't this guy already say that he was... Like, he says basically, like, the company's pressuring him to kill a story he was making because they can't afford the legal trouble? It's no longer a question of whether or not it's, like, the right thing to report on anymore, right? You talk about protecting his own, his job's on the line. And now suddenly this Julia character is making it about her? She can just say, okay, yeah, you don't need to make excuses to me. I know why we're killing the story. We're done. But then so she's, she's like, being personally offended by it. He mutters something under his breath, ending with a self-pitying chuckle. I don't know if you even want to work under a scumbag like me from now on. Oh, come on. Don't turn this into a pity party. 
No, I'm absolutely a scumbag. Why is that? Because I'm firing you. My thoughts are scrambled. For a brief moment, the state... Oh, she was... He was her boss, too, and she was pulling that shit? For a brief moment, the state of my bank account displays before my eyes with startling clarity. A howling void opens in my chest and starts traveling towards my stomach. No, don't panic yet, you idiot. Get more information now. There must be a catch. And what about my work? Let me get this straight. Ever since we met, I've been working on stories and pieces no one else in your office would touch with the ten-foot pole. Constantly interviewing total nobodies, always busy traveling to the middle of nowhere, or regretting my last trip. Repeatedly ordered to clean up someone else's mess. Julia. All your long-winded spiels about how the disposable work is the most important work, and suddenly you only remember the disposable part. My feelings about the quality of your work remain the same as ever. It was vital. It kept the magazine going. I will always appreciate it. Then why would you threaten to fire me? I would never threaten you. It's a done deal. They've made their decision perfectly clear. They? What they? Who is this, who is this they? Glances left and right, then points upward for a short moment. Then he speaks again in a hushed voice. You know the big kahunas. Can't really question them. They wanted your head on a silver plate. He's not looking me in the eye. You're not joking. I would never joke about stuff like that. It's real. Fucking hell, it's real. Damn it, damn it, damn it, damn it, damn it all to hell. All these years, all this grind, all my plans, and for what fucking asshole you know I deserve better, I always deserve better, and always ends with me going down the drain back to the sewers, fuck! No. Take a few deep breaths. Don't lose the plot now. Keep yourself together, you idiot. The moment you show weakness, they go for your throat. Get back in control. Can't do this. I wish I didn't have to, but it's a lost cause. No, I mean it's impossible. Julia, you can't fire someone who's never been hired in the first place. Takes him a few seconds to put on his, oh, I get it face, let out a troubled gasp and start mess massaging his temples. Lodestar had, has been my biggest source of income for the past few years. That much is true, but technically, nobody has ever hired me here. It was all freelance jobs. The full-time position only served as a kind of dangling carrot, a promise of a decent pay grade, career perspectives, maybe even some kind of insurance to save my failing health. And the recognition I would get for being a part of the Lodestar team, a position that everyone around me seems to respect aside from me. Then why did I want it so much? There will be time to mourn what could have been. For now, I should act like I don't care. You know what I mean. If I let you work even under a fake name, it would be a guillotine for me. This is ridiculous. You know I'm just going to start shopping the story around from the second I leave this room, don't you? Of course I know. I told him. Any response? Let us worry about that. Well, that doesn't sound ominous at all. I do wonder if I could get accustomed to one of these loud mechanical keyboards some people here love to use. Whenever I did my work in here, I was still expected to bring my own crappy laptop and sit closer to the lobby. Always on the outside, no matter how hard I try to break in. The vibration in my back pocket feels like a bad omen. I decide to ignore it for now. I've been working on this fucking story for, I don't know, 16 months on and off? I know. You kept cheering me on. I know. We have even agreed on the pay that I'd receive. I know. I'm two months behind on my rent. No, wait, two and a half. I catch him off guard. He's momentarily taken aback and that gives me an empathetic stare. Don't you look at me this way. You don't have the right. I didn't know. Well, now you do. Look, if there's anything I can do to help. If you can't tell your big kahunas to fuck off, I don't think there's a single thing. Julia. I pull out a smoke and light it up. Gotta get back in control. Well, you're not back in control if you're subservience to a fucking nicotine addiction, which might be what explains your failing health, might I add. Please don't do that. There's a smoke detector here. No worries. Nick turned it off a few weeks ago. Probably the most creative thing he's done in the past five years. Good old Nick. The perk of this 21st century cinema reviewer. Never has an original thought of his own. Just relies on his purely algorithmic taste to stay likable. And the best thing is, it works. Funny, I used to dream about this job. It was Brian who killed his dream, making me realize Nick won't be unseated anytime soon. And offered to teach me the ways of an investigative journalist instead. Wasn't the career I ever wanted to pursue, but to my dismay, I turned out to be surprisingly good at it. Till this Montgomery thing happened. Serves me right. Lesson learned. Should have pursued my dreams instead. 
Stop it. Nicholas is a good friend, a respected critic, a member of my team. Put out that smoke. People tell me I let you step all over me. Why do I even let you act this way? Because you once told me honesty is more most important in a mentor-student relationship. And it works both ways, because I thought we were friends. He bites his lip and stares sideways to avoid my eyes. At the end of the day, bosses aren't friends. Must have been a terrible mentor if I didn't even teach you that. Okay, I, I have nothing to say to that. The best I can do for now is just stay silent. I don't feel too stable right now, like I could explode any second. Julia. I might have failed as a guide, but I will do what I can not to leave stranded, okay? There are options. None of them are a remedy for all your troubles, but ugh, wait a second. Another vibration in my pocket, another foreboding feeling. This time, I reluctantly take the smartphone out of my pocket. It has to rain. Why not let it pour? A new email! A lengthy one, and the sender, speak of the devil. No, 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 this can't be. Christ. Got, uh, an email from Mila Lopez. Claims she's just been laid off from Double Spyro. Same as, uh, Mike Antonoff and Jared Rivera. What? It's... what happened? I'll spare you all her insults, okay? The key information is it seems their HR knows all the confidential information about my journalistic investigation and used it to shut everyone's mouth. Well, apparently Montgomery walked up to Lopez as she was emptying her desk and told her to thank me for being a, quote, dumb and careless cunt. Brian goes pale. I think he was a very good reason, too. You fucking scumbag. You outed my sources? What? what? Of course not. What are you even saying? You don't even... Don't you da even dare play coy. It must have been either you or me. No one else. You know the way I work. My investigation is basically untraceable, both on and offline. Carefully picking meeting spots, encryption upon encryption, every direct quote rewritten five times, just in case, all sorts of red herring scattered around. I know my shit, you know I do. And this timing, did you just pass a flash drive to your beloved big kahunas during a meeting as a sign of goodwill? Look, I get you're upset, but why don't we just talk about this calmly? Alright, I'm sorry for no fuck you. Okay, let's take it step by Fuck you, you're right, we should not nah, fuck off. Don't even give me a choice if you're going to do this. Fury takes the wheel and I'm just here along for the ride. I can't do anything about it. In a deranged way, realizing you're just a passenger and your own body feels liberating. Let's just see it all unfold. Calmly, fuck you, Brian. Julia! I've been paranoid for months and months, acting like everyone I didn't know was an assassin or a corporate spy. I know I haven't messed up. Not in a way that would implicate all of them. You. You goddamn. You thought you could get away with this. I haven't done anything improper. Don't push the blame on me. So what? You're claiming it's my fault because you you're never the guilty one? It's always the bosses, the economy, the obligations you have. And now me? You're being silly. Quit with this martyr bullshit. Calm down or I'll have to. You immoral shithead. You motherfuck God, calm down, for God's sake. And so it goes. I yell out a lot of words I wanted to say for a long time, but I held back. I, f I fling a lot of insults I've been workshopping for years, hoping I'd never use them. I break a few things. At times, for a split second, I see pity in ever somebody's eyes. It's gonna haunt me for a long time, but in the heat of the moment, I don't care. These people. Oh, this company has nothing left to offer me. So at least let me take this catharsis. In the end, a security guard has to escort me out of the building, and that's the end of my journalistic career. I just feel like my world has crumbled into nothing. I mean, you have every right to. Like, Jesus, if I were you, I would have already broken down into a sobbing mess. I'd love to, but I'm on a subway. Far too proud to cry in public even now. And, and? It's stupid, but I feel like somebody out there keeps destroying everything I hold dear just to see my reaction. Like it was a prank show and someone was waiting to record me crying. Out of sheer spite, I'm doing my best not to cry. Fuck you, whoever and wherever you are. That's the most Julius Sawinski thing I've heard. Spite, uh, spite as the greatest motivator, huh? Not feeling particularly motivated to, to do anything right now, to be honest. I just want to stay in my bed until my shithead landlords calls the cops to forcibly evict me. Not surprised, shit. I know that whenever life decides to fuck you over, it's always one thing after another, but this is much. 
How much is too much? Let's recap this last week of June 2019. I've been kicked out of my job. Well, not that I've ever been hired, but... But let's just say my mentor broke every vague promise he ever made to me. A big thing I'd been working on for a year and a half went down the toilet. All useless. My boss didn't protect my sources properly, and now they keep trying to reach me through every possible channel to threaten me or just yell at me. And they have every right to react like that. All of my side gigs were shut down, nobody's replying to my emails. Someone's been dragging my name through the mud behind the scenes, and it worked. I still have no idea who's sending those shitty messages around. I've been asking, but listen, don't worry about it. I'm not going to stand idly by and watch you get cancelled by some spirited... I said, don't worry about it. I have three unread messages from my landlord. The message previews were stressful enough. A call came from Chicago. Apparently dad has bladder cancer. Mom is in hysterics. She'd go crazy if she heard about my situation. So I have to pretend everything is okay whenever she calls. She calls every day. Just won't hang up before she offloads all her burdens on me. And I can't blame her because we all had to learn to cope with dad's psychopathic tendencies somehow. I was robbed. All my documents and what little money I had gone. Don't even know when or where it happened and it's driving me crazy because I'm always extremely wary of pickpockets. The list goes on. I don't want to sound paranoid, but it really feels like a concerted attack. Paranoid is good. Paranoid. Paranoid is good. Anyway, I know you're always, you always hand wave this topic away, but just remember that if anything happens, my place is your place. You don't have to get through it alone. I do. I've been a trouble, trouble magnet. As self-centered as I may be, I don't want it to affect you. I know. Listen, I have another call. All right, just call me if anything happens, no matter how dumb it seems, okay? And swing by whenever you can. I will. Thank you. See you. I put my phone away, exhale, and blankly stare in front of me. Christ. I glance at my reflection in the window. Just look at this idiot. Whenever the situation requires me to dress formally, I still feel a bit like a child cosplaying as an adult. Should have just followed the dress for the job you want advice and continued dressing up like some like a trust fund kid who keeps partying on Brooklyn rooftops for years without a care in the year. Care in the world, I can't talk. <sighs> it's only after a while that I realize the car is empty. Unnaturally so. I start feeling uneasy, but someone enters my peripheral vision. That's the last thing I unconsciously register. The world dissolves. When I come to, I'm out of the subway, standing in a back alley I don't recognize. It's pretty dark. My eyes start adjusting, and I try to figure out what happened. The gun in my hands. Faint silhouette at my feet. It's not moving. Somebody stands in front of me, covered in shadows. I can't fully make out her face, but she's staring at me with visible intent. She speaks. Her voice is raspy and androgynous. Her tone hateful and mocking. Aren't you a nasty one? What is going on? Who are you? Don't play coy. My mind goes blank. I look at the ground. There's a body riddled with bullet holes. I recognize who it was. The corpse belongs to Mike Antonoff, one of the double spiral whistleblowers. Source. He was just threatening to get back at me a few hours ago. Before I can even feel the tiniest bit of compassion, I face a terrible realization. They will think I'm guilty. Oh my god, am I guilty? How is this real? It wasn't me. I don't even know what's going on. Listen, I was just riding the subway. Again, don't play cool. Who knew him? He was mad at you. You started telling him sob stories about your situation. He wasn't, he wasn't having none of it. He wasn't having none of it. You gotta get, cut me a little bit of a break when I struggle to read this stuff sometimes. It's like, when someone says paranoid is good, like, uh, my, my brain immediately tries to read that as paranoia is good, but that's not the sentence. <laughs> Do you see why I stumble over this text sometimes? He wasn't having none of it. You got mad. Things escalated. You died. It isn't true. It's plausible, but it doesn't make it true. Or does it? It's just a nightmare. It doesn't even make sense. It must be a dream. And if it isn't, the person in front of me must be responsible. There's a faint voice in my head screaming that it's her world, that I'm just living in it. What the fuck have you done to me? Nothing yet. But I'll do what I can to get you locked up for life. This is a murder in the first degree with special circumstances. 
Her detached voice and nonsensical tone only reassures me this can't be real. I refuse to believe it is. Before I even manage to think this through, I point the gun at her. If I did murder him, you wouldn't be acting like that. You wouldn't be standing in front of me. You'd be running away, calling the police, begging for help, yelling that I'm a psycho. Oh, you are a psycho. But I'm not a coward. I won't let you walk out of here alive. Doesn't make a single lick of sense. Tears well up in my eyes. Why are you doing this? Because sometimes, one has to confront what they're really made of. There's no two ways about it. She's got to be nuts. Slowly but surely, she starts walking toward me. Stop right there or I'll shoot. Go on. The only way you can get off the hook, isn't it? The only way you can survive. You will definitely prove you are the monster I claim you are. What the fuck is this tone? So controlling, inauthentic, patronizing. Serious. For your own sake, you'd better be. He keeps getting closer. Maybe I did kill Antonov. Maybe I don't deserve to live. Maybe it's less tiring not to live. Maybe I should just let her take care of me. Maybe I will just wake up. Or maybe this insane reality needs to be rejected as violently as possible. Maybe a world that wants to destroy me deserves to be destroyed. He's right in front of me. It's now or never. Shoot. I close my eyes and squeeze the trigger. A loud bang echoes through the alley. Afraid to look at what I've done. I've been to a shooting range once and felt absolutely horrified by pistols. Such a small thing, but it can easily puncture a hole in the fabric reality is made of. I don't know why there's already been so much dialogue just saying, like, the reality is not real, blah, 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 blah. Never knew I'd be able to use it against another human being. The very thought makes me want We're a right choice after all. I'm so glad. You haven't allowed yourself to break, but you've crossed the line I needed you to cross. There's a silent flame in you that would become an inferno if left unchecked. I sure hope it will. She's still alive. Her voice is coming from behind me. She puts her hands around my waist and her cold mouth touches my neck. I feel my shirt getting violently torn off. I don't understand, but I'm too dazed to protest. That was your final test. Congratulations. Self-worthy. I feel something sharp sliding into my neck. Not too painful, just startling. Think, a doctor pushing a needle into your vein without proper warning. Then it hits me. Your bliss. The dopamine reactors I've been considering completely pride until now suddenly recover and start bombarding me with pleasure I'd never known before. I finally let the tears go. They come flooding. They've been waiting for years. It's such a relief. Is it raining? I feel like I'm in the middle of a deluge at least. Washing away all of my fears, all of my sorrows, all of my anger, all of my pain, all of my ego. I become one with the world and the woman behind me. She's holding me tight, making me feel like the only important thing in the world. Everything else blurs. I feel something intense toward her, something I've never felt before. Is this love? I hope it is. This is not you, hisses a familiar, cynical voice in the back of my head. But it's okay, I never felt particularly fond of me anyway. New York, you're perfect. Oh, please don't change a thing. He who laughs in the shadows always has the last laugh. Hallelujah! Praise be! Everything is cliche, nothing is. Isn't that the ever-distant utopia I've been chasing all along? People on other trains, I hope you're doing fine. God, shut up, just enjoy it! Finally understands. He's making love to me. He's giving birth to me. He's burying me. Pretty sure I've been dead for a while. Pretty sure I could stare at my own corpse in her hands from a distance for a moment somehow. And then I'm alive again. She shifts her mouth from my neck. No way, I taste blood in my mouth. Was I drinking her blood too? I realized that whatever this was, it's over. I have to bask in the afterglow while I still can. This is just very, very... I mean, not surprisingly sexual, but, like, much more sexual than I expected it to be. I also immediately understand that I'm going to chase this fleeting feeling for the rest of my existence. Well, that kind of sums things up, doesn't it? Finally, she lets out a whisper, which includes the ceremony. No matter what happens next, don't forget, you're a monster. But you were lucky enough to be born into a world of monsters, so don't you ever mourn that fact. Brace it. Trophy earned, shrouded in shadows, Vampire the Masquerade. 
All right, well, took 40 minutes, but, you know, the conflict was uh, quick enough. Once again, I find myself in Big Beat Burger. Familiar surroundings, faces I recognize, moon, same as it all ever was. Still, I process it in an entirely different way. It all frustrates me now, or more precisely, makes me frustrated with myself. Like I'm clinging to the remnants of a cocoon I've outgrown. Ugh. <laughs> we needed a, a a redrawn character model, which changes almost nothing about my appearance, apparently. Same with these cigarettes. I don't need them anymore, so why do I keep holding on to them? Fucking hell, it's like I refuse to accept that I'm something better than I used to be. A vampire. Just two nights ago, I met Karen. She embraced me, by which I mean turned me into a kindred. She calls herself my sire, and me her child. Last night, she taught me the basics of survival, drinking blood, manipulating humans, bending steel, controlling shadows. Tonight, I expected more lessons. Instead, she just told me to go out and enjoy myself. What's the catch, I asked, to be... Which she responded, I might kill you if you prove to be a disappointment. There are a few rules. I have to uphold the masquerade. I can't contact anyone I knew was as a human. I can't let anyone realize I'm not a human anymore. I can't embrace anyone, and so on. Otherwise, I'm free to do whatever I want. But for some reason, the first thing I did was come back here. Old habits die hard. Aaron is probably watching me from somewhere even now. The way I understand it, tomorrow night she is supposed to introduce me to Car Amarilla, a local, a local society of vampires. I've heard some of these terms before, mainly from listening to the Spoonie one talk about the LARPs he's been a part of, but, uh, yeah. Turns out they're the ones who have been systematically ruining my life lately. All of a part of some secret evaluation that I barely passed. Just imagining the reach they have makes me dizzy. That was kind of my guess. After they destroyed the old me that I barely cared about, Aaron rebuilt me anew. On, a, on one hand, her tests left some scars that will take some time to heal. On the other hand, maybe I should just be grateful. I am snapped out of my thoughts by a sudden scream. Some douchebag yelling about his french fries not being salty enough. I think this is my cue to leave, permanently. Goodbye, BBB. Eh, hope I never see you again. So did they... That, that was just a different expression character slide? That just gives her a a, a, a slightly misgiving look on her face. I'm not sure that was necessary, but okay. I'm destined for greater things, you see. Tribute of justice. A meathead bully and his unfortunate victim. I probably shouldn't interfere, but... What? I have a choice of... Well, or am I choosing victims or some stuff? This Tinder addict smells like a bit of a loser, a wannabe intellectual, a perfect source of nourishment. Risks of swiping right. Dan dance macabre. Time to swing a little more on the devil's dance floor. The club beckons. Tribute of justice. A meathead bully and his unfortunate victim. I probably shouldn't interfere, but what better chance could I find to test what I've become? Okay. I'm not sure how important these choices are to anything. Two men are facing each other in a dark back alley. One of them stands with his back against the wall, his chest heaving as he's struggling to catch his breath. People! Anybody out there? I'm being robbed! A brawny, rugged guy is yelling at metal staircases, the theatrical incredulity in his voice. With a lively step, he dances around an older man who's having trouble finding his footing. What is this bullshit? Oh, so now you can talk? Good, because I'm dying to hear what you did with my wallet, Holmes. Wallet, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm confused about the dialogue so far. The goon says, is people, anybody out there? I'm being robbed. Pitiful victim, what is this bullshit? 
Oh, so now you can talk. Good, because I'm dying to hear what you did with my wallet, Holmes. Wallet? I have no idea. Oh, okay, I've been misinterpreting this from the word go. The goon starts prancing around like a Muay Thai boxer. He's smiling, but his eyes send a clear message. You're cornered, buddy. Don't even try to pull a fast one on me. Come on, homeboy. You may be able to trick an average Joe on the street with your act, but a fighter recognizes a, f a fighter. It's like an animal thing. It's an instinct thing. You've got some moves on you. You're like shits. You're like a black mamba. Lightning fast reflexes. Starts shadow boxing for a moment. The man's definitely got energy to spare. However, I'm like a king cobra. Met your match. Two apex predators locked in battle. Oh, so you're seeing snakes? That would explain some... Before he's able to finish, a sucker punch knocks the air right out of his lungs. The old man slides down the wall. Before he can let out a groan, he's interrupted by a brutal kick to the chest. That's what I'm talking about. A fighting spirit, even when you're cornered. Urgh. Take a deep breath. Collect your thoughts before you speak again. Remember where, where you put my wallet now? i pretty sure you broke my rib. An eye for an eye, a rib for a ribbing, biblical punishments. It's only fair, homie. Fair? I l at least admit this is a mugging. Wallet my ass. Still in denial? Okay. Let's say I had about five thousands... Five thousands... Again, thousands... Bucks in there. Give me six grand, I'll let you walk away. Relatively unharmed. So you admit it. Admit what? That this is not about proper compensation. This is a robbery. Look, buddy, this is the beginning to bore me. Unless you want me to go all Anderson Silva on your ass, give me what I want. Anderson Silva? Yeah, Anderson Silva. Flying knee meeting your solar plexus. The man, the myth, the legend. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Thai Boxing, Western Boxy, Taekwondo, Wing Chun, and Kaporia combined into a single fighting style that can only be described as straight-up murder. I've been studying the glorious singularity that is Anderson Silva for years. Every move I have, I owe to him. But what is... Is this, is this how people mug each other these days? <laughs> what is this contrived shit? If you don't want this snake to turn into a deadly spider, show me the money, honey. Summer 2013, Las Vegas. Huh? Watched it live, on pay-per-view. Weedman saw through all of Silva's tricks, whooped his ass, broke his spirit, showed him for a fraud he is. The man hasn't been the same ever since. All the empty showboating, hollow taunting, drunk on his own Kool-Aid, Jesus. Of course you idolize him, asshole. For a good minute, the goon silently looks up and down. Looks down at the whimpering man at his feet, chewing on his lower lip. When he finally speaks up, his voice betrays an intent to kill. You know what, homeboy? Screw the money. This is a matter of honor now. My thoughts exactly. Ha! He raises his fist. Got ourselves a mixed martial arts expert here, huh? For your own sake, I hope you can back that talk with your some self-defense skills, homie. This is pathetic. Boosting your self-esteem by beating up an injured old geezer? God damn, you're pathetic. He jumps at the sound of my voice, turns my way into the turns my way in the blink of an eye, and immediately assumes a combat stance. The reflexes are sharp. Looks like he's had at least this much back up a uh, back up his bra bragado. Bragado? What? Bragado? It's like he's. It's like they're trying to say braggadocio and bravado, and it just came out bragado. <laughs> Is that a word? Is that actually? I gotta look that up. Is that a word? Back up his bragado. Bragado. Empty boasting, bragging, I including results for braggadocio. No, only search for brigado. Brigado meaning individuals who are show-offs. Okay. 
I've heard of braggadocio. I've heard of bravado. I've never heard of braggado. <laughs> Wannabe Anderson Silva's face betrays utter confusion upon seeing me. He's got no idea how I managed to sneak up on him. I don't blame him. I wouldn't be able to explain it myself. It felt like I became one with the darkness, my pure consciousness traversing a dusky dream state, jumping from one shadow to another as if they were different trains of thought. Think of some experiences I have had with psychedelics, every blink an adventure. I am I was outside of this alley. Blink, I was above the alley. Blink, now I'm in front of this guy. And he pisses me off. The older man slumps down, looks like he was trying his best to keep it together and gave up once the cavalry arrived. The goon regains his composure and barks at me in an overly gruff way. The hell are you sneaking around here for, Chica? Move along, this is between men. I kind of had, like, a, a loose impression he, he, he should have, like, some sort of, like, vague Central American accent, but whatever. Not anymore. His fist turns toward me. I'm serious, an equal opportunity ass kicker. I respond to the threat with the brightest, most innocent, virginal smile I can put on. So you're into shadow boxing, huh? Something comes over me. I can feel the darkness embracing me, whispering sweet nothing in my ear, pumping me up for what's to come. Reverse elbow, crane kick, low spinning sweep. Let's crane kick his ass. Cool, but have you ever watched Karate Kid? Before he manages to respond, my foot meets his chin. The move is absolutely impractical, but I managed to pack so much strength into it, the guy's body reacts as if he has just received a powerful uppercut. I know what he's thinking, I should have blocked it, and he absolutely should have. But instead, he just flailed his arms helplessly, as if suddenly found himself in front of an oncoming train, a primal expression of fear that suddenly and completely took him over. I don't know how I... How I look right now, but judging by his expression, my best guess is like the gaping maw of some primordial beasts. I follow up the surprise attack with another punch to the solar plexus, or at least my nearest estimate. Once again, the effect terrifies even myself. Looks like my hunch was correct and I hit the right spot. He falls to the floor, whining like a wounded animal, tears streaming down his face. Well, this guy was went down fucking easy. I let him collect himself a bit and then grab him by his chin. Learn to choose your battles, boy. Let me go. Let me, for Christ's sake, just let me go. I kick him in the direction of the alley entrance. He staggers off, quickly disappearing from my sight. I check on his victim. Looks like he's unconscious. Wow, he whooped his ass, girl. But hasn't noticed anything out of order. Good. I was getting worried I might have overdone it a bit. That woman did say that keeping a low profile would be crucial if I want to survive. You all right? Need help? He managed to stand up. His smile is strained, but it suggests he's fine. Or at least trying his best to seem fine. No, oh, you gave me all the help I needed, and then some. Thank you, miss. What's your name? Jessica. Thanks, Jessica. I was worried for a second. This asshole's bark was worse than his bite. He's probably in worse shape than me now. I guess that counts as a victory. I'd better be going. My wife is probably worried sick. But before that, if there's anything I could do to repay you... Wallet, please. <laughs> uh, yes, there is. Wallet, please. He gives me a puzzled stare and laughs uncomfortably, then realizes I'm serious and goes pale. Not this again. You might have gotten lucky with that washed-up Silva wannabe, but I'm basically Joanna... Uh, I can't pronounce that. You don't want to mess with me, Wallet. He considers his options for a moment before breathing out a deep sigh of frustration, passing me the wallet. You're an MMA fan? An ex-copywriter. It used to be my job to know all sorts of you garbage. He raises his eyebrows and then gives the wallet in my hand one last longing glance. Don't even think about it, Black Mamba. Unless you want your friends to hear about a scrawny copywriter girl kicking your ass. What an unconvincing threat. I want to crack up at the tone of my own voice. Just a completely botched delivery. Still, somehow it works. The man makes a quick exit. Well, as quick as his limp lets him. I peek into the wallet. 5000 No, $5,500. Wow. Who the fuck carries that much money on them? 
My guess is it wasn't obtained legally. I just hope they're the real deal, and not marked bills or whatever. It seems that my rent has just been taken care of. Jesus. The future's looking bright. Okay, so I have to hit all of these just in different order. That last one seems like... It, it was almost like side quest levels of quirk. Where it's like, hey, this is gonna be... This, th this is the mission where we're just gonna talk all about just martial arts... <sighs> The club reeks of death, and I love it. I've been here quite a few times, but I've never seen anything this breathtaking. Everyone around me is whacked out of their minds. As they keep dancing madly, the spirits dance beside them. Spectral silhouettes phase in and out of existence, becoming more visible the more intense the music grows. It looks like a bizarre ritual. Profane mess. I notice it's the voice samples the ghosts react to the strongest. The most suggestive ones cause them to appear distorted, even tormented. As if something was struggling to be born out of the harsh sounds, and the dead were hoping to be reborn alongside it. They're all uneasy, quivering with desire for something far beyond their reach, probably the same as when they were alive. Sometimes the living dancers spot their dead counterparts. It's usually the most manic ones who notice something out of the corner of their eye, for only a split second, but never realize what they've glimpsed. Some apparitions dance to a completely different tune than the rest of us, one only they can hear. They seem, those seem the saddest. The spectacle is eerie. At times, it's unbearably me melancholic. Above all, it's I keep on moving to the rhythm until I reach a trance-like state, and something even stranger happens. Every now and then, when I brush against someone, a fragmentary vision appears before my eyes. A car burning on a freeway, an outstretched hand in the depths of the sea, a man jumping out of a skyscraper window. Memories of the past? Preventable visions of the future? I have no idea what it means, but I'm strangely eager to find out. And then there are dancers like her, ones that aren't ghosts, humans, or even vampires, but something else altogether. This new world is full of mysteries, and I plan to get to the bottom of the ball. But for now, I just want to dance. Wow, what a night. I watch Times Square from above. Beautiful. Never thought this place could make me emotional, to be honest, but here I am, feeling deeply... Who could have thought? Getting up here was surprisingly easy, all things considered. Took more thought than physical effort. Earlier tonight, I started experimenting with this body's limits. I realized I can jump over small buildings and climb steep walls of the now, and my whole perception of, the, of space has shifted. I planned a scenic route across the rooftops. A scenic route across the rooftops. I did my best to avoid attracting attention, just as I was told. Stayed in the shadows as much as possible. I spot a drone from afar. For a second, I feel uneasy, but I remember what she told me. Machines won't get a clear view of me anymore. Camera footage, photos, it's all glitched out or blurry. Wouldn't take it for granted if I didn't try to catch my reflection earlier on. I couldn't see my face clearly. Not in the mirror. Not even in a puddle. My face was like one of Dolly's clocks. He told me to keep a low profile regardless. Someone might el someone might take note and track you down. He didn't care to elaborate, but it didn't sound encouraging. Suddenly it hits me that I might never be able to take uh, be able to see my own face again. I won't even be able to take care of my looks by myself. But what about the long-term psychological effects? A knot of anxiety tightens in my stomach. Jesus, this is probably just the tip of the iceberg. What else is going to change? Calm down. Wait a second. These past few nights have been the best of my life. For years, I was on a downward spiral. Spiral. Failing health. No future. A feeling of overwhelming powerlessness. Now everything has been flipped upside down. A total paradigm shift. A bad ending is no longer the only option. I'm actually looking forward to tomorrow. I forgot how that feels. Where it used to stand at mere seconds to midnight, the doomsday clock has been effectively turned off. A cold breeze brushes my cheek. As stupid as it sounds, I choose to read it as the world telling me to chin up. I can bend anyone to my will. I am capable of superhuman strength. I'm a master of shadows. I can even pay my rent. In Brooklyn, of all places. I can do anything. Tomorrow night, I will be introduced to my duties. 
If everything goes according to plan, I will become a New York City representative of Clan La Sombra. I think all the clans might have, like, different hours and stuff, but I don't know what La Sombra is. Whoever they are, whatever that means, I have no idea what to expect. But tonight is tonight. I'm free. All my worries from a month ago feel like they belong to someone else. Finally, things are looking up. Okay, we got another title drop. I'm getting the vague impression that those three choices that I had, I, I either was not able to complete all three of them, or so long as I chose this one, it would have advanced me. Maybe as long as I completed any two, it would auto-advance me, and then I'd miss out on the one opportunity I didn't take. March 2020, back at it again at Big and Beat Burger, middle of the pandemic. Familiar sounds, familiar smells, familiar faces. Yet again, I'm recalling that night when everything finally seemed to change for the better. I mean, it's not like I wasn't expecting everything to go back to the old depressed normal. Even in the thick of it, the rational part of me recognized my state as temporary. <clears throat> I would like to- Whoa, my mistake. I would like to point out that we've uh, made multiple references to, like, the real world with, like, Google documents and, you know, actual people who have appeared on, like, television and stuff. And all of a sudden, it's, like, fucking 2020 and she's smoking in a food establishment? That is not a thing anymore. It used to be a thing, but it's not a thing now. This is a fast food joint that you can smoke in? I don't think I've ever seen such a place. But with these highs, it's always been a hope it won't end, or maybe that an ego death will finally occur. Be satisfied, you stupid fucking bitch, I command you. Here's all the logical evidence for why you should be satisfied. Here's the obvious direction for your life, and here's a detailed explanation of how you should treat the people that care for you. No dice, I always fall back into the same old habits. It's like they were encoded deep in my DNA. The aimlessness, the powerlessness, spiritual exhaustion. Goddamn fast food trips. Stupid fucking self-loathing, now amplified whenever I drink someone's blood. Maybe I should just blame it all on the misfortune of my birth. You do the social climbing until you dissociate, and then it's just this untethered, constantly frustrated ball of dumb desires. Except I'm sort of immortal right now, and I need to figure out what to do next. I watched this obscure Asian movie, Ellie Ellie Lemma Lab Bash Bonnie, starring Tabanobu Asano, one of the coolest guys in the world. He plays this Mersbo like figure, a legendary noise musician. I don't know fucking any of, any of that. There's this mysterious virus spreading around the world, causing despair and mass suicides. A rich CEO's granddaughter gets sick and longs to die. So he spends a fortune searching for the cure. Turns out Asano and his friend, played by this violent onsen geisha guy, are traveling through Japan, searching the corpse-strewn towns and fields for any unique item that can produce beautiful sounds. As it turns out, the avant-garde walls of noise they create are able to heal the infected. The CEO begs the band to help, offering them all the money they want, but for some reason they refuse. Through a series of flashbacks, concerts, and vignettes, a mystery unfolds. Eventually, we realize that Asano's music is not just a remedy, it's also a cause of the virus. Whenever it connects with people, they get this hunger for more extreme, more novel experiences, and eventually they hit a wall. Nothing can satisfy them anymore. They lose their will to live. Not even the musicians are spared from this curse. They know the end will come sooner or later. The girl is saved by a mind-blowing concert, but the tragedy is merely postponed, not averted. The last shot of a Jesus-like Asano silently considering his role as savior and destroyer stayed with me. The form of the film is abrasive, little to no narrative coherence, some weird cartoonish creative choices, the Japanese noise soundtrack, the very freeform and hard to understand weak themes. But at this point, movies like this are all that truly connect with me. Okay, it's probably a real movie, all things considered. But that's not actually what I want to look up right now. 
One second. Oh, I'm an idiot. Well, I have just figured out that I uh, did not say what I was intending to say, which is to say that um, Shadows of New York is not the first game in this expansion. It's apparently the standalone expansion. <laughs> so it's supposed to play Coteries of New York first, but this is a standalone game you can play separately. Okay. Anyway, it was released on 2020. It was probably developed well before that point, but I find it interesting that this was released in 2020. They describe the events of the game taking place in 2020, and then it, like... <laughs> It makes this very, very quick references to, like, a pandemic. Alright, well, because the game has not explained anything to me, I'm reading the Wikipedia article now. The player makes dialogue and story choices. As a vampire, the player character needs to balance their bloodthirst with their humanity, while also ensuring they do not reveal themselves as vampiric, breaking the masquerade. Based on the choices the player makes, the narrative branches. In addition to the game's main quest, the player has access to side quests, and loyalty quests. The latter involves creating bonds to the characters in their party, also known as coterie. But that's at least coteries in New York. Player character can belong to one of three vampire clans, which affects their character's ethics and dialogue, and how the members of the player's coterie react to them. The choice of clan also determines that vampiric abilities, disciplines, the player can use. A Bruja character can use Celerity, Increased Speed, and Potence, Increased Strength. A tor uh, Torador character can use also use Celerity in Aspex, Auspex, 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 Supernatural Senses. And Ventru can use Fortitude, Increased Resilience, and Dominate, Mind Control. And all three can use Presence, Attracting or Scaring Humans. These abilities can be used for problem solving, as well as in combat situations when interacting with characters. Well, that all sounds kind of interesting, but it's, I've not seen any of that in this game so far. Let me see the expansion. Uh, Shadows of New York. This These cause branches in the narrative leading to two different endings. There are two different endings to this game, with multiple playthroughs required to see everything. Oh my god. They also shape the player character's personality and outlook. Taking the role of a vampire from Clan La Sombra, the player investigates a death and explores New York, making connections with other characters while needing to satiate their character's bloodthirst. As a La Sombra, they can use shadow-related abilities and can communicate with inhabitants of the other side. Okay, so that's- I just have, like, basically a shadow step. There's a lot less said about this than there was about the other one. Okay. <sighs> I 
I'm the New York City representative of the Lasombra clan now, also known as the Night Clan. They are masters of shadows who cast distorted reflections and make modern tech go haywire in their presence. Last year, a few months before I was embraced, the Lasombra had joined with the Camarilla, the biggest and most traditional sect in the vampire world. The two groups actually used to fight each other, but our leaders found some intel that made them reconsider their strategy. They sent a diplomatic mission to parlay with their historical enemies. The deal they got in Chicago is simple, an unlife for an unlife. For every Lasombra vampire allowed in the Ivory Tower, one Lasombra vampire has to meet their ultimate end. I still remember the name of the woman who met her final death so I could begin my unlife. Her name was Hester Reed, a sworn enemy of Camarilla, a guerrilla fighter who spent decades opposing them. She was someone with far better principles than mine, from what I've gathered. But whoever she was, her execution by my sire served to convince the New York City elites to give us La Sombra a chance. Then they set out to look for a mutually agreed upon candidate who'd become the clan's rep in the city. I feel like we're just skimming over a bunch of fucking plot that uh, probably would have been more interesting to actually portray rather than just skim over. I mean, we, we, we dawdled so much just on that fucking conversation of her getting fired from her job. My sire searched for someone who gave the impression she was more than she appeared. The local port was looking for someone they could walk all over. After long negotiations, they decided I was a good compromise. They proceeded to syst systematically destroy my entire life just to make me show I was psychologically strong enough to join their ranks. The turncoat special, they called it. Somehow I succeeded. And it eventually led me right back to where I started. I stopped writing and put my pen down. Will that be all? Yes, Ms. Duval. I hope you enjoy your stay in London. Oh, I very much doubt I will. Just like every cultured person, I think the only good Englishman is a dead Englishman. Get the hell out. Not interested in a small talk with someone as sociopathic as her. I finished the front. Wait, if I, you're gonna give me fucking text dialogue options of how I respond, and you just decide not to have me say the thing I'm choosing to say, what what is even the point? It just sh further emphasizes how fucking railroaded this is. It's one thing when you give me like three, three answers to a question and they're all the same fucking answer, which this game has also already done. And then it's another thing when you give me three choices and then clearly when I choose one, that choice is not even reflected in the actual fucking story that unfolds after that. What the fuck, dude? Come on. Uh, that will be all. Tell Kadir I said hello and farewell. Safe travels. Don't let the door hit you on the way out, psycho. Oh well. I'm the lone La Sombra in this town, and my representational role means jack shit. No title, no perks, no whatever. Right now I'm the quartz gopher, doing all sorts of work nobody else will touch. My main duties? Being a sort of immigration officer. See, New York City is probably the biggest vampire travel hub in the USA. And definitely the biggest one on the East Coast. Almost every kindred arriving from Africa and Europe comes through here. The local Camarilla is nuts about bureaucracy and population control. So every vampire leaving or arriving in this town is supposed to check with me to inform me about their travels. Well, in theory at least, the VIPs play play by the different play by the different rules. The VIPs play by the different rules. This was developed by people who speak English, right? How how is the how how have I I've noticed as many typos as I have already? They take care of this stuff through connections and servants, but for the smaller fish, I'm like a vampire statue of liberty, the first blood sucker every kindred coming to New York City should see, on paper anyway. The first after the prince or Kadir, the primogen council. But these things vary. Yeah, I am naturally, I am a naturally traitorous La Sombra, so they still prefer being traditional, hands-on about these things. 
As I said, at the end of the day, I'm just a gopher, and this work only serves to remind me I'm not quite in just standing at the gate. They haven't even given me an office. I just meet everyone in public places, such as coffee shops or the fast food restaurant. Some consider this an insult and lash out at me, but luckily most of them understand we're in the same boat. Only here because we're curs and need to be reminded of our place from time to time. Speaking of, my last client is 15 minutes late and I still have more errands to run tonight. This is getting irritating. To be honest, I should just find some self-respect and leave. But I won't. My sorry upbringing left me with this stupid sense of responsibility. Ten more minutes pass. Eventually an unfamiliar woman appears by the door. She tells someone to stand by the door and walks in. Long chestnut hair, body stuck in her late teens by the look of it. A fashionable scarf covering most of her face, elegant clothes, dignified walk. I signal her to sit in front of me, trying my best not to let my impatience show. She obliges. Here to check in. I am. Julia Sawinski, I presume? She's scanning her surroundings like we're at a circus. I hope you won't mind if I make it quick. I'm needed in Elysium. Name? Catherine Wee. Uh, I swear I've heard that name before. Someone else's description of her crosses my mind. That weird lady who owns the art hall but is never there. Weird? So it is her, Catherine Weiss, the owner of the art hall, de facto headquarters of the New York City Camarilla. For fuck's sake, Julia, what are you doing calling her weird right off the bat? God knows you've already made a fool of yourself in front of enough VIPs in the city. Recover. I'm sorry, it's just that I still don't know many people there. So I have to go by the descriptions I'm given by the members of the Primogen. Well, the description is mostly correct, outside of that one word that slightly perplexes me. Hot calling the kettle black sounds like. So, uh, from what I've gathered, it's just that your interests are rumored to be not fully aligned with the Camarillas. It irks some folks up there. Being a keeper of the Elysium is not enough for some, I see. I suspect it as much, but what can you do? She seems chill. Cool. Anyway, uh, Catherine Wheeze. Wow. Yes, want me to spell it? Since people often have trouble getting it right. Forgive my indiscretion, it's just that people of your stature usually don't bother checking in with me. They usually report their arrival to one of the Primogen, and they make all the arrangements. I heard Prince Panhard, Panhard, is busy with the preparations for her big party. I uh, assumes that if I spared her some paperwork, she'd appreciate it as a gesture of goodwill. Besides, I wanted to meet the infamous Lissambra representative out of sheer curiosity. My interest peaked once I heard about her. She looks around knowingly. Unique circumstances. Yes, uh, Prince Helen Panhard had trouble justifying the exorbitant rent my property would need. That's literally pennies for her, and as far as I know, she's been sitting on an empty property since last year. Looks like you've got it- they've got it out for you. Bad. That's what I assumed, but it's nice to get confirmation. Well, it's not like my clan has ever been particularly popular. She just seems like an entirely different character now. Like, the way of- way she speaks to her, her fucking vampire employers seems entirely different from how she spoke to her human employers. Is that sup- it, like, it, is that really supposed to be part of the point? Where when you become a vampire, it like, changes your personality and shit? I don't get it. Yes, just to make sure, you've never met Hester, but you know of her? I do know I wouldn't be here if not for her. Have you two met? No, I've only heard of her once or twice. We had similar outlooks on many issues, although we tended to come up with completely different solutions. In any case, I think it's meaningful that Hester died so that you could live. They feared her, now they fear you, and that's why they're keeping you down. If anyone who's not a VIP said this to me, I'd laugh in their face. Oh, I get what she's doing. She's trying to buy my favors. Best not act like I'm easy to please. Stick to business. Time will tell. In the meantime, I'll need you to help me out with my documentation. Of course. So where are you coming from? Washington, D.C. She says it the way people in Hollywood movies say it. The way that sometimes suggests her Washington is wildly different from the Washington you and I would see. What were you doing there? Take a guess. Government work? Write that down. It ought to amuse Helen a bit. 
you say so. Date and hour of arrival. He takes out a plane ticket and slides it towards me. It's all here. 1 a.m., got it. Method of transit, plane, purpose of visit. Meeting with Prince. Ought to work just fine. I guess. Estimated duration of visit. Undefined, right in six months if you really need to. Place of accommodation, conditions of intended stay. The art hole, conditions should be adequate. You tell me, I tend to be happy with Airbnb, home sweet home. I'm not certain that I ever felt particularly at home here. That makes two of us. Curious, do you have nothing holding you? The face of a blonde-haired friend appears in my mind's eye, then vanishes. Nothing holding me anywhere. I see. Prolonged silence. He stares into my eyes, and I return the stare. He's studying me. It's unnerving, but I do my best not to turn away. Eventually, she smiles. Didn't you say you were short on time? Oh god, yes. Kadir will kill me. I quickly begin to collect my stuff from underneath the table. You can simply inform him I paid you a visit. He'll understand and he'll pass it on to everyone who should be in the know. I'll do that. Good, we'll see each other soon, I hope. The party tomorrow, right? I, uh, wasn't invited. He gives me a pitying look. I understand. Well, if not given the opportunity, we should make our own. I'll be in touch. Good night, Miss Wise. I wish you a pleasant stay. Good night. And don't rush these things. You've got your whole unlife ahead of you. You're in a position where you can take it easy. Take your time. Get a different perspective. I nod and walk slowly out the door where I lose sight of the restaurant. I quick, I sprint toward the subway. Slow night? I wish. You're late again, by the way. I hope you have a good excuse. Adir al my, as my mighty sheriff of New York City, is not happy with me. No wonder, I met him in front of Elysium 30 minutes later than the time we had agreed on. Yeah, well, Catherine fucking Wheeze decided to arrive fashionably late. A likely story. She's supposed to be out of the city. If you think I'm pulling your leg, boss, feel free to check my report. I pass him all the official papers the way I do every other night. Peter stares me down for a good few seconds, then his steely gaze softens. You're serious. Wheeze and McDonald's with the mask and elegant clothes. Surrounded by the smell of french fries and hamburger patties? That must have been one hell of a sight. Technically, it was BBB, not McDonald's. But yeah, god, I made such a fool of myself. First thing I did, I quoted somebody calling her a weirdo. Wanted to die on the spot. Serves you right, you're walking... You're a walking... You walking faux pas. I've been trying to teach you to control your tongue, but you never learn a new gaff every week with you. Still, there's good news and bad news. The good news is Catherine has a fondness for vampires of humble beginnings. Probably why she decided to see you in your, shall we say, natural habitat. One of those rich art scene assholes who seeks out working class cred. I did say something about watching your tongue. The bad news is she is very astute. But she can recognize a moron like you straight away. You never stood a chance at all impressing her. Oh, shut up. You still need me for anything else? I'll get on it straight away. Wouldn't be standing here chatting with you if I hadn't taken care of my duties. Thirty minutes is all it took to finish preparations for the big party. About to see everyone off. Sorry. Couldn't be helped. Suppose it's more your loss than mine. I just wanted some company tonight, and you really could use the chance to appear here on an official duty so everyone could get to know your face. Heaven knows your fast food job isn't going to get you anywhere. Need to, what do you call it, hustle? You don't need to tell me that, but it's not like... Oh, I can't be bothered with this, man. Okay. Well, I, it was a matter of time before I, I just completely lost all fucking patience with this game. This is my fucking problem with visual novels, is that they just go on and on and on and on, and there's just no game. There's no game. These aren't games. These are interactive stories. Which is not the same thing as a game. If I want an interactive story, I would get a quicker, more exhilarating read by picking up a Give Yourself Goosebumps or a Choose Your Own Adventure book. Those are more entertaining than actual visual novels like these. Is there more money and more production effort going into these games than those books? Yes, but you know what? It... These, the books are actually interesting. You can game over in the books. You can die. <laughs> and the last Give Yourself Goosebumps book I read has like 20 fucking endings. This game has fucking two? 
for all the decision making that's supposed to fucking matter? <sighs> the best, like, kind of story games I've played. And by story games, I mean games that are nothing but the story, and like, basically no, require no skill whatsoever. Are like the Telltale games, like the Telltale Walking Dead games. Those are at least engaging, like emotionally engaging, interesting, brisk, and they give you meaningful choices early on. Do they have like a huge impact on the ending of the game? No, not really. But are they, like, important choices over, like, do you save this person or this person or do you do this or do you do that? Like, I'm not seeing any of that here. None of that's reflected. I'm seeing, like, dialogue options that are identical to each other. I'm seeing dialogue options that don't actually have the effect on the game they suggest they have. Just the worst kind of fucking... Visual novel, just railroady text dialogue, faux choice bullshit you usually get. <sighs> All right, well, I'm I'm fucking done with this one. I'm not gonna play coteries. I'm not interested. So, you lost me, game. Next time, maybe be a game. Bye.